My name is Noah Greenspan. Uh, I have been a physical therapist in cardiopulmonary and complex medical for almost 30 years. Uh, most recently, when COVID hit in March, we closed our pulmonary wellness and rehabilitation center and started seeing acute COVID, chronic, uh, post-acute COVID and chronic. And we now have a clinic in New York City called the the post-COVID uh, rehabilitation and recovery center clinic at h and Physical Therapy. If I could just make this the most valuable for you in the next hour, and I talk fast, so it is good that it's gonna be recorded. Um, I would just love to take five minutes to hear a couple of questions that people might like to, um, or what you might like to learn from this. And I think that will be a very worthwhile investment of time. Do people have the ability to unmute? So this is uh, Regina from the Long Beach VA and we don't have any post COVID therapy rehab now. We do have a lot of COVID patients. I'm just kind of wondering how that will apply if we're able to kind of get a new program started. Okay, great. Anyone else? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Anyone? Well, Ruth is going to get all, all the time then for the next 57 minutes. Um, <laughs> all right, here's some questions. All right, so let's get started. So first and foremost, so at this moment in time, I've seen in personal consultation about 230 COVID long haulers, and we have about 1,500 long haulers in our boot camp. Uh, which is an online program. So a couple of things, and by all means, if you have questions as we move along, feel free to jump in and stop me, unmute. Uh, you probably won't throw me off. If you do, it'll be more entertaining for you anyway. Um, so COVID is unlike any other condition that I've ever seen over the past 30 years during the course of my career. Um, the closest thing that I would say to COVID is HIV. And I don't mean in terms of pathology, but what I mean is that COVID and HIV have a similarity in that there is so much variability. Uh, number one, not just from person to person, but very often even within the same person from week to week, day to day, sometimes even within the same person within the same day, and oftentimes what seems like minute to minute, okay? Um, What's really important and what my strategy was at the beginning, since we didn't know anything about COVID, was you really have to be attentive and you have to listen and look and feel uh, much more than you try to advise and much more than you try to deliver a treatment because every person is going to be different and everything that we thought before COVID is different with COVID. So in other words, Shortness of breath pre-COVID is not the same as shortness of breath post-COVID. Chest pain pre-COVID is not the same as shortness of, uh, as chest pain post-COVID. Um, you know, and fatigue pre-COVID is not the same as fatigue post-COVID. So it's really important that, you know, a, a very, very comprehensive assessment is done and continues to be done for the entire time that you know this patient. So literally from the first time that you have that communication, it's going to take a while. It's not like a, a patient who's got like a frozen shoulder and comes in, oh, it hurts when I do this, it hurts when I do that. No, it, people can come in and they could sometimes have 20, 30, 40, 50 different symptoms, okay? And initially, when we first started hearing about the new novel coronavirus, we were told that this is a uh, mostly respiratory condition that affects your lungs and your breathing. And in 14 days, you go on your merry way. And we know now that nothing could be further from the truth. And, you know, a lot of it is luck of the draw. So what, what, what is the reason why one person has a, a, a seven day asymptomatic course when somebody else, as many of our long haulers are, um, are still suffering 10 months, 11 months going on a year for some of these patients. So that's really important. And it's also really important to understand that there's, so the patient that's been in the hospital um, who was on a ventilator, who was in the ICU for three months. That person is not necessarily a long hauler, right? There's a difference between that person who had acute COVID 
and who wound up in the ICU on a ventilator, totally deconditioned, and who then comes out of the hospital and is very, very weak, deconditioned. Um, their aerobic capacity is diminished. Maybe they had a loss of muscle mass or efficiency. Um, these people are not long haulers. While they're certainly going to have a long haul, these people really respond like somebody who was critically ill. So if you think about your pulmonary fibrosis patient, your COPD exacerbation, your myocardial infarction patient, your congestive heart patient, um, patients who are very debilitated, whose initial insult then leads them to behaviors that are going to further um, exacerbate the insult. So for example, patient winds up in the ICU, uh, you know, due to an exacerbation of congestive heart failure. So maybe now they're on a ventilator, maybe now they're not moving, they're becoming deconditioned. We know that as the body moves less, the body becomes less efficient at using oxygen and so on and so forth. So these people really react like somebody who is critically ill and who is recovering. And in many ways, these patients even have it easier than long haulers because long haulers, uh, there's almost no rhyme or reason to it. So we've seen people who are very sick and who have been very deconditioned and who've spent a lot of time in the hospital um, and they come back and they come back slowly, um, but they come back with kind of a predictable linear course. And this patient would be more common to most of the patients that you've probably seen in the VA before. Often these are older patients. Often these are patients with pre-existing conditions. So all the people that you worried about before, the older patient with heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, obesity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, those are the people that were most likely to be admitted to the hospital with an acute bout of COVID because I don't know where most of you guys are, but I'm here in New York City where like, you know, getting into an ER was like the hottest ticket in town and like at no other time in history was somebody who was short of breath, complaining of chest pain with 102 fever told you're not sick enough to be admitted to the emergency room, except that happened over and over and over again. The overwhelming majority of long haulers that I see are women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, okay? And I mean like 85% are women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. I've seen a couple of women in their 20s. I've seen one young lady who was 12 years old I've seen some people in their 60s, a couple in their 70s. I've seen three in their 80s, nobody in their 90s, nobody over 100. So this long hauler population is not the group that we would traditionally think of as the most at risk. And in fact, their health at the beginning may have even put them at more at greater risk for becoming a long hauler because they were told, go home shelter in place, ride it out, you'll get better in two weeks, except they didn't. And so many of these patients we didn't see for three months, four months, five months, and who knows, maybe they had four PEs during that time. Maybe they had six, you know, maybe they had a stroke during that time. Maybe they had, you know, uh, something that went on an acute exacerbation of pneumonia or something like that. And so it's interesting because also 90% of the people that I see got sick in March. And we're actually doing a study now on patients who got sick in February, March, and April. Um, because again, that was the time when it was a pure triage operation and it was life over limb. And the only people being admitted to hospitals were people who were really imminent to pass away in the next several hours. So those are the long haulers. And that those people don't respond like a critically ill patient those people respond much more like a multi-system trauma patient. So when I work EMS, uh, I have a partner who loves trauma and I don't like trauma and he, and I love medical because it makes sense and he doesn't like medical. So we're perfect partners. Um, but the difference between trauma is that if you get hit by a Mack truck, that Mack truck is not orderly. Okay. That's not an orderly event. And so it may affect, you know, five different systems or five different body parts in a way that is completely random. And that is what we're seeing with the long haulers. And that's why I say they respond more like a multi-system trauma patient than a critically ill patient. Any questions so far? All right, so first and foremost, um, there's a whole, still at this time, there's still many, many, many more questions than there are answers. There are still many, many more things that we don't know than we actually know. So anything I'm gonna tell you today is gonna to be based upon my own experience, my pre-COVID experience, plus you know about a year of COVID experience. Um, but again, there's no treatment plan that I can give you that's gonna work with 
every patient. And even more so, there may not be a treatment plan that I'm gonna give you that's even gonna work with two patients. So what's really important is that every single program that you do with a patient is completely individualized for that patient and individualized for that patient based on that day and that week and that month and what position the patient is in at that time. So what I mean by that is that, um, you know, sometimes you'll see a patient and we may start them on a walking program and they may walk two minutes and be fine. They may walk three minutes and be fine. But if they walk three minutes and 30 seconds, well, guess what? They're now in bed for two weeks. Okay. And we learned this unfortunate lesson very early on because we had a boot camp that we developed two years ago for cardiopulmonary patients. And these are patients whose average age was 80 years old um, with heart disease, lung disease, multiple medical conditions. And this boot camp turned out to be too vigorous for many of the COVID long haulers. So what we wound up doing was we wound up um, you know, revamping it, slowing it down a little bit. And we, we went to a different kind of treatment protocol, whereas boot camp gave you something progressive and new to do every day for 42 days. With COVID, we really have to take it day by day. And if, it's, if you did two minutes and you felt good, great. Then tomorrow we're gonna to do two minutes again. If you do two minutes again and you feel good, great. We're gonna do it one more time just to make sure that we really own that ability. And the other thing about COVID that's very, very you know, common is that it's not just how you feel during the actual session. There's something called post-exercise malaise, um, but there are people who are fine during the session, who are fine later in the day, but then the next day they're shot. Um, so there's that. So one thing that I say is that it's really important that we throw a stone and really a pebble. We got to throw the tiniest pebble, even a grain of sand and wait for the pool to ripple and see what the effect is, not just during that exercise, but later that day, the next day. And we need to really wait until that pool returns to normal before we take that patient any further. Um, so there's that. The other thing is that we know that COVID is tremendously inflammation based, right? And the things that we worry about most. So when I'm evaluating a patient, I'm always thinking life over limb first. So I'm always thinking about the things that are potentially going to put my patient's life at risk. So the cardiac system, okay, first and foremost, the neurologic system, second, the respiratory system, third, and then everything else, while, you know, it may be extremely uncomfortable and may make you very, very feel very poorly, it's likely not going to be a life and death situation. So in the same way that somebody, you know, comes in reporting chest pain, uh, my, my MO is always to treat it as if it's the heart until proven otherwise. So in other words, if somebody is reporting chest pain and we assume, uh, you know, and, and, and we assume it's the heart and it turns out to be that bean burrito that they ate at lunch, well, no harm, no foul. Uh, it's uncomfortable and awkward, but the patient doesn't get hurt. Whereas if we say, well, you know, it's probably gas or it's probably this, and it turns out to be the patient's heart, well, then we have a problem. And the other thing is that the symptoms and signs of COVID uh, that people experience are not always the same or consistent with what people are doing, uh, you know, with what people had beforehand. So in other words, chest pain doesn't necessarily mean coronary ischemia, but it could mean coronary ischemia. So it's the idea that, well, what it looked like before may not be what it's now, but it doesn't mean that it's not. So we have to really be soaking things in all the time, minute by minute. And the more monitoring you do with patients, the better it's gonna be. Now, we know it's very inflammation-based, okay? And there's a couple of concepts that I have. And one of them is kind of like a pendulum. And COVID is kind of like a pendulum that swings from negative 10 which is the most inflamed to 10, which is the most healthy and well, okay? When people are in that super inflamed state, okay? Negative 10, negative nine, negative eight, negative seven, negative, that is not the time to push exercise at all, okay? At all, okay? In those cases, exercise can actually be harmful for you. And if you think about it, the first rule of medicine is primum non nostere, which means first do no harm, right? So we may not know what to do, we may not know what to do, but we know that we don't wanna hurt somebody. So when you see somebody who's very inflamed, how do we know that they're inflamed? We know that they're inflamed because their symptoms are unstable. They're not, they're not settled, they're worse, 
they're more frequent, right? And when we think about exercise, we always talk about the fit formula, frequency, intensity, time, and, and type of exercise. Think about your symptoms in the same way. So the more frequent your symptoms, the more intense the symptoms, the more symptoms you have, okay, the more inflamed you're going to be. So when people are in that boat, we also know besides just inflammation, we know that COVID is very, very much a sympathetic inflammatory system, uh, uh, syndrome. So we know that there's a hyper involvement of the sympathetic nervous system. And we know that this is where you guys are going to have to go back and, and really study physiology because this is all physiology here. Um, and, and that's what COVID is. It's like physiology 101. It's like dissecting and taking apart this tangled web and saying, what's really going on here? So people come in, it's a very hypersympathetic condition, very fight or flight. So this is why we'll see people with high heart rates. This is why we'll see people who have chest pain, but there's no evidence of it. Um, this is why we'll see people who have these, you know, kind of inflammatory pain syndromes. So when somebody's in that state, the order of business is not push them forward. The order of business is quiet the sympathetic nervous system, right? Quiet the sympathetic nervous system. Anything we can do to reduce inflammation things like breathing exercises, things like meditation, things like, you know, it could be medication, it could be, you know, other, other types of things too, but we need to quiet that sympathetic nervous system before we even think of moving forward, okay? So a day that doesn't get worse or a day that is stable is a good day. And, you know, I think of it a lot like this, like if the house is on fire, okay, we must put that fire out before we think about putting up the wallpaper again, right? And that is post COVID. So if somebody's in that inflamed state, and again, it's not rocket science, it's not like a, an, something that's completely objective that we can measure and say, you know what, you're at negative three, you only will get that information by talking to your patient a lot and for a long time. And even more than talking to your patient, listening to your patient, looking at your patient, feeling, you know, this is very interesting, but. The objective stuff here, this is where like all of the, um, all of the, uh, what do you call it? Um, all the new age uh, kind of touchy feely people, they're gonna be the ones that lead us out of this. You know why? Because guess what? In COVID, the objective stuff all turns up normal. So if we talk about the evaluation, right? I talked about the cardiac system. I talked about, um, you know, the neurologic system and I talked about the respiratory system. Um, so just to give you a couple of examples of why this can't be used um, as effectively, um, there are patients that come in with chest pain, right? So what's the first thing you think of when you have chest pain? Or what's the first thing you worry about? Feel free to unmute and speak if you like. Or just stare blankly at me, that's just as good, it's okay. Um, but let, let, so let's say, so for me, when I hear someone say chest pain, the first thing I worry about is a coronary syndrome, right? An acute coronary syndrome. So the things I worry about most, coronary insufficiency, I worry about heart failure, and I worry about arrhythmia, right? So what's the first test that somebody would normally get when they go to an emergency room? An EKG, right? But guess what? In 90% of these patients or more, the EKG is normal. Now what? Okay, what's the next test? Echocardiogram, right? In 90% of these patients, echocardiogram is normal, okay? Stress test, in 90% of these patients, stress test is normal, okay? Stress echo, in 90% of these patients, stress echo is normal. So now what? Do you cath a 25-year-old woman? No, because the odds of her having coronary disease are slim and none, right? But now we have a situation where all the testing has been done and everything is normal, and this leads to one of the things that people complained about early on, many people who are long haulers was doctors saying, guess what? Everything is fine, right? But everything is fine, but you have this crushing chest pain that doesn't allow you to walk to the kitchen and back without sitting down for 30 minutes or more after that. So that puts us in an interesting spot because now it seems like you've done a very thorough workup and found nothing. Person still has chest pain. What does that mean? Who knows? Um, I will say that a lot of people have all normal tests. And what I just mentioned is where most people would stop testing, right? They wouldn't go on to a cardiac MRI 
right? Because they'd say, you know what? Everything came back normal. We learned about the electrical rhythm of the heart. We learned about the circulation of the heart and we've learned about the mechanics of the heart and everything was normal, but the patient feels bad. So that would usually be the end of the workup, right? But we know that many people have things that show up on cardiac MRI, even if everything that I just mentioned before is normal. So that's one potential problem. When it comes to shortness of breath, okay, certainly there were people who early on had, you know, this COVID pneumonia, people who, you know, we were worried, of course, there was all this talk about is, you know, are there going to be this huge number of people that require lung transplants down the road because we were worried about pulmonary fibrosis. But what we found is that while some people did have some pulmonary fibrosis or some indicators that are consistent with pulmonary fibrosis, thankfully, we've seen um, a lot of people who um, over time, those ground glass opacities have resolved, right? So we know that it's inflammation and not necessarily something that's going to be permanent. So that's not for all patients. That's for some patients, but shortness of breath. Okay. Let's do a chest x-ray. You know what most chest x-rays show? Normal, right? CAT scan. You know what most CAT scans show? Normal. Pulmonary function tests. Most pulmonary function tests, normal. Why are you short of breath? Right, so now we have a patient who, um, or you have an MRI of the brain or a CAT scan of the head, they're normal too, right? So we have patients and the most common symptoms that we're gonna see are we're gonna see profound fatigue, not fatigue like, oh, I just walked 10 miles and I'm tired, but I can't lift my head off the bed and lift my arms enough to get a drink for days or weeks or months on end, okay? That's one chest pain, okay, but chest pain that doesn't show up anywhere objectively. So what is causing it? We don't know. Shortness of breath, but shortness of breath that doesn't show up anywhere objectively. So what is causing it? We don't necessarily know. Um, people are not deconditioned, okay? People are deconditioned who are in the hospital for a long time, um, but the deconditioning is not the thing that's preventing people from being able to do their everyday activities or their physical activities. Um, there's something else there, okay? And if you've ever read the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, there's one of the things is keep the main thing, the main thing, right? So if somebody comes in and they say, you know what, my main thing is shortness of breath and that's taking 50% of my ability away and 25% is chest pain and 15% is diarrhea and 10% is brain fog, we have to take that all into account. And that's why we have to think of COVID long hauling as a minefield where we have to take very, very measured, calculated steps. And only once we've taken that step and we're sure that we're safe on that spot that we're in, can we move forward. Another thing with respect to inflammation, okay? Um, I have seen, and it feels to me like almost like an electrical grid which is like, once you kind of trip the grid, it spreads to all systems. So the inflammation is going to show up differently in different people. And what we've seen is, you know, one of my friends named uh, Greg Sweeney at NYU said, um, he said, COVID is like a virus scan. He said, it's very opportunistic. It finds your weaknesses and it, it exploits them. So if you had a predisposition to something before, COVID's going to find that and it may, it may pull, you know, it may cause that to flare, or maybe you were going to have a problem that you didn't even know about and it's causing that to flare. Um, but one of the things about inflammation is that we have to take into account all of the inflammation. So as I said before, we initially thought this was a respiratory problem. Then we thought maybe it's a cardiac problem. Then maybe it's a GI problem. Then maybe it's a neurologic problem. But we're, what it really is, and again, this is going to vary person by person, is it's a respiratory condition superimposed on a cardiac condition, superimposed on a neurologic condition, superimposed on GI. And then when we talk about autonomic dysfunction or dysautonomia, that's a whole other roller coaster, or as some people call it, the Rona coaster, um, you know, to itself, because that's like, you reach into a bag and you pick out all these dice. It's like, it's like the Dungeons and Dragons dice. It's like some of them have 20 sides and you just roll them and whatever comes out of that bag that day, that's what your symptoms are going to be. So we'll talk about those as we go a little bit, you know, as we go a little bit further into it, but we know that it's highly inflammatory based. The other thing is that it seems like whatever your body does with inflammation, when you overdo it, it's going to go to that default 
of what your body does with inflammation. And when we talk about overdoing it, you know, we talk a lot about a budget, like an energy budget, but what we found with COVID is that it doesn't matter if it's physical or emotional or cognitive, okay? All of those can have the same impact and they can all trigger inflammation. And so once that switch is tripped, the inflammation grid kind of takes off. And then it's almost like a cutoff switch in your car where until that actually settles down, and that's what I was talking about when I said, throw the stone and let the pool ripple, until that pool is still again, we don't have any business going further. This is not no pain, no gain. This is not go, go, go. This is quiet, breathe, be. Again, all that new age mumbo jumbo that, you know, really is very good. And it, I have to be honest, and I apologize for this. You know, I, I know a lot about the heart and the lungs, and I know a lot about the ocean. After that, I'm, I'm out of information. So I didn't actually know what kinesiotherapy was until I got this invitation and I looked it up. But, you know, it seems to me like you guys are balancing, you know, the cognitive and the emotional and the physical. And that's a great position to be in because all these things impact inflammation and all these things impact recovery. And it's almost like you have to think of it like, you know, inflammation is like a net total. So in other words, you could have some inflammation in your gut, or you could have some inflammation in your lungs, or you could have some inflammation in your heart, or you could have all of the above. And inflammation in one area will trigger inflammation in another area. And in the same way, if we can reduce inflammation in one area, that can help to reduce inflammation in the other areas. So that's really the big long game. And it's, it's you know, that's what I focus on each and every day with every single patient. And, you know, people think we're like giving them the third degree because we're asking them, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about, is it, is it squeezing? Or is it pressing? Is it pressing or is it, you know, pushing? Is it pushing? Because those things getting to understand how, you know, how to really speak the patient's language will help you try to figure out what is what and what's causing what and what we can do to, do to affect it. So the other thing I mentioned is autonomic dysfunction. So we talk about the autonomic nervous system, which we know we have the voluntary system, which is I want to lift my hands up. I do it. Autonomic is I don't have to sit there and tell my heart beat, 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 or I don't have to tell my stomach churn, 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 or I don't have to tell my blood vessels constrict, relax, constrict, relax, right? That's all autonomic. And we have the sympathetic nervous system, which is fight, flight, or freeze. And we have the, um, the parasympathetic, which is, which is rest, digest, and heal. And again, in this, what we see is we see this fight or flight, fight or flight, fight or flight. The system is constantly charged and that's very inflammatory on all systems. So initially when somebody's in that heavily charged state, it's quiet that sympathetic nervous system, enhanced parasympathetic turn, tone. Um, and then as somebody becomes less and less inflamed, then we can start um, you know, giving them a morsel of exercise, right? It's like a morsel of exercise and let's see what that is. And it sounds crazy to say, we think in one minute increments, but we think in one minute increments, right? And somebody's gonna say, you want, wait a second, you want me to do one minute of walking today? It sounds crazy, right? But believe it or not, sometimes going from one minute to two minute can make a difference. So there's that. So again, first order of business, do no harm. Um, and then little by little, you know, so, so while I've, while I've come to realize that there may not be a lot of things we could do to speed up the healing of COVID or, or long hauling, there's a lot of things we could do to, to slow it down or to get in the way of it. So the biggest thing that I hear over and over again is people say they overdo it, right? Somebody could be doing very, very well, and then they overdo it. And again, that could be emotional. They could be, they could have a fight with their wife or their husband or their friend, or it could be something positively emotional. Guess what? Susie had the baby. Everybody's healthy. But that's a big kind of, you know, emotional charge that gets the system going. And that can trigger that default inflammation. It could be physical. It could be, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, I was feeling so good. And my next question is, and what'd you do? That becomes confessional, right? They're like, you know, I was feeling great. So I decided to take a hike. How long was the hike? Two miles. What's the longest you've walked before then? Four minutes. So you took a two minute hike. And that is enough to trigger people to where they have a setback, a flare, a relapse, um, whatever you want to call it. So this is really 
inch along, inch along, inch along. Think of yourself as like, you know, zero dark 30, where we are trying to dismantle a bomb and make sure that nothing blows up in our face. Any questions so far? Comments, feedback, anyone? All right, good. I hear someone. I have a question. This is Bridget, and I thank you so much, Noah, uh, Dr. Greenspan, for being oh, involved with this. Um, so, I guess the time frames I'm not I'm not seeing maybe um, our understanding. So, is this somebody that's been, like you said, maybe not admitted to the hospital? What's the time span you're seeing people from po post the actual acute COVID? So, if we talk about long haulers, okay. Um, long haulers are um, long haulers are people who recovered from their acute bout of COVID, and then for whatever reason either didn't get better, or they got better and then they got worse again, or their symptoms resolved or got better and then they got more symptoms, or their symptoms got worse, or they got new symptoms, or they traded some symptoms for other symptoms. Um, and again, you know, it's the person who went through acute COVID and for whatever reason, just didn't get better. Or, you know, and is still fighting it weeks, months. And again, we have a lot of people who are just about going on a year. So again, the time frame is gonna be different from different people. But I think the common characteristic is people who had the acute bout, got over their bout, they're no longer positive, but they're not better, okay? They're still experiencing symptoms. Um, if there's no other questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, I'm going to take you through a, a bit of my evaluation process. And um, again, keep in mind that what I'm about to tell you is not do this, okay? Because again, I don't even do this, okay? It's not like I say, this is going to be the same every time. It's again, in the same way I do my evaluation, throw the stone, wait for the pool to ripple. You know, we are in a position as humans and particularly particularly often as healthcare professionals, where we're, we're used to feeling like we know everything, okay? The first thing if you wanna treat post-COVID patients is get rid of that and, and adopt a position where, you know what, we don't know anything, right? We don't know anything. So we have to find out. It's like, we just were assigned to the case. And so we have to start collecting clues and start collecting evidence from scratch. So I'm gonna go through my eval process. And then if people have questions, feel free to jump in. It's not a problem. So. This I have a question. Yep. Um, so I work at the Federal Health Care Center and I have worked with some active duty military that um, are looking to get back to be able to pass their PFT test, but are obviously long haulers. And I guess at our facility, there is no clear cut um, like guidelines for um, you know, oxygen saturation or allowable heart rate levels. Yep. So maybe you don't have an exact answer, but, you know, I'm asking for safe levels and guidelines because like you said, all their tests are coming back normal from stuff, but they're struggling yep. and need to pass tests. And um, so it's kind of like a back and forth, but we there's no set guidelines. So looking for a little guidance as to what's safe, maybe as far as a heart rate or oxygen saturations? So that's a very simple answer. The answer is I don't know. Um, and that's the answer to most questions. Um, but let me tell you why I say that, okay? Um, so as I said before with these diagnostic tests, uh, we may not see uh, necessarily, we may see vital signs that are perfectly normal, right? We may see an oxygen saturation that's 98% and the person is still very short of breath. So what does that mean? Um, or the person may have chest pain, but there's no evidence of ischemia. So there's not a way that I can say to you, like we are of course monitoring vital signs. However, okay, they don't necessarily make sense. So like, for example, let me just show you quickly. What our... So this is our lab right here. And if you notice, Everything that we do is fully monitored. We have people hooked up to EKGs the entire time. We're checking oxygen saturations and blood pressures every five minutes, okay? But again, they're usually normal. And somebody can have all vital signs, but still have 
um, still have symptoms. So we're looking at the vital signs to make sure that we obviously don't do anything dangerous. Um, however, um, I think one person is unmuted that seems to be shuffling a deck of cards. If they if they could just un if they could just um, mute, that would be great. Um, so the thing is that the normal things that, so when I do cardiopulmonary rehab, these are my numbers, okay? So heart rate, I'll let people go to 200 minus their age, as long as there's no other uh, things involved, right? So say, as long as everything else is good, that doesn't always happen. But as a general rule, if somebody's, you know, 70 years old, I'll let them go to 130 and not be worried about it. Blood pressures, if somebody's under 80, I'll let them go to a, a peak systolic blood pressure of 200 at a peak. Not that I'm looking for that, okay? I'm not trying to do that. But as long as everything else is okay and the person is working out very vigorously and they don't have coronary disease and they don't have aortic stenosis and they don't have other things that, you know, potentially put them at risk, then it's okay. Oxygen saturation, if we're doing a test, we'd normally let somebody to go as low as 80% on the test. However, if that person does that, if they go into the 80s, then we're going to supplement their oxygen when they exercise. Now, here's something that, you know, so, so one thing is that we started seeing pulmonary fibrosis patients in 1995, when at that time, nobody was doing rehab on these patients because they thought they were too sick for rehab. They'd come in, their oxygen saturation would be 85% on oxygen sitting in a wheelchair. They'd stand up, their oxygen would be 75%, and then they'd take three steps and their oxygen would be 60% and they'd be blue and they'd be breathing at, you know, 50 breaths per minute. And people said, you know, you're too sick for rehab, right? So what is the translation of too sick to rehab? Go home, wait to die. And thankfully I had a mentor named Horatio Pineda who was not just a great doctor, but he was a really kind and compassionate human being. And he allowed us to experiment with things that, you know, we'd say, well, listen, this patient's going to, you know, being told to go home and wait to die or being put out of the lifeboat anyway, what do we have to lose by giving them a shot, right? So we started experimenting with 15 liters of oxygen, 20 liters of oxygen, 25 liters of oxygen, where basically we're blowing oxygen at these people and they're maintaining saturation. So initially it takes 25 liters, but that 25 liters allows them to begin to do the workout, right? And that workout is ultimately what's going to help them become better at using oxygen. So what we found over time was that people could do more. People's oxygen saturation at rest got better. People's oxygen saturation with activity got better. And that helped us learn about oxygen supplementation for people with pulmonary fibrosis and who have, you know, diffusion issues. In around 2001, we started seeing pulmonary hypertension patients and similar type of group. Every time they stand up, they feel like they're going to pass out. Sometimes they do pass out, right? Same thing, blue, okay? Low saturations, high heart rates, chest pain and pressure. These patients are scary, right? Because we're saying like, hey, you expect me to exercise. I can't even stand up. But that's why we do everything fully monitored because we say, hey, even though this feels terrible, then, you know, we, we, we know you're okay. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it was scary for us too, but that's how we learned. Um, and then a few years later in 2007, we started treating POTS patients, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And it just so happens that those three groups of patients taught us the most about how to best take care of post COVID patients, because we see people who are short of breath, who have chest pain, whose saturation sometimes is low, sometimes it's not. And people who, um, you know, who's, autonomic nervous system is wacky. So it doesn't respond in the way that it should. So if we talk about POTS and we talk about this dysautonomia, one of the common things is that when people stand up, they get dizzy or they get lightheaded or they feel fatigued. It's almost like a cartoon where you feel the blood draining out of you. Um, if you think about it, you know, again, this is physiology 101. Like you have to go back to the stuff that you're like, hmm, I haven't thought about this in 30 years or so. But it's like, you know, somebody stands up what happens? Blood goes down. Now, sometimes we do see a drop in blood pressure. Sometimes we don't, right? But think about it. The body wants homeostasis. So even if I lean over this way, the body is designed to kind of constrict and dilate and shift blood around so that you maintain a stable blood pressure. But when you stand up, blood goes all the way down, okay? And what we're seeing with a lot of COVID patients is that under normal circumstances, the body would pick things up. And we know that the baroreceptors are located in the carotid sinus in the arch of the aorta. And you know 
the body says, hey, wait a second, we just dropped the floor out of our blood pressure and it would normally send a signal out to the periphery and we would get vasoconstriction. We're not seeing that in these patients. So patients are standing up, we're not seeing that vasoconstriction. So the question with dysautonomia or autonomic dysfunction as it relates to COVID is, is there a problem with what the autonomic nervous system is sending out? Is there a problem with what the body received? Is it a problem with what the body's sending back? Or is it a problem with what the autonomic nervous system receives? So I talk about autonomic nervous system dysfunction and rehab kind of like marriage counseling. It's like we have to reestablish that relationship little by little by little. So it's like the first night you want to try something new, you go out to dinner in the neighborhood. You don't say, hey, we're going to try it with a 14 day European trip, right? Baby steps. And it's the same type of thing with COVID. Um, other things, uh, compression stockings play a very, very big role. Okay, why? Because they give you that splint to not allow such drops. And sometimes, again, we see normal vital signs. Okay, we see normal vital signs, but we have to, you know, not assume, but we have to ask ourselves what's actually happening here. Why is this person, when they go from lying down to sitting up, well, that's a big change, right? Then they go standing up and then, it, you know, more blood drops. And sometimes we don't see a drop in pressure. But I think of it a lot like kind of like an Aunt Jemima. I know she has a new name, so I don't want to be offensive to anybody. But it's like you turn over a, a syrup bottle and a lot of it goes to the bottom at first. But then you have that stuff that drips down the side slowly. And sometimes people hit that tipping point where it's like, oh, that's it. I feel symptomatic now. So again, you have to do things very, very slowly. Compression stockings make a big difference. Electrolytes make a very big difference. Fluid makes a very, very big difference. Um, so there's not a specific number that I would give you. And a, another thing that we see is we see a lot of people with tachycardia. We see people whose heart rate will be 150, 160, but if it's an SVT, right? Supraventricular tachycardia, then it's not really an accurate 160. Like it's not doing that because of the workload that somebody's experiencing. It's, it's an arrhythmia, right? So it's an autonomic arrhythmia. And so the normal vital signs go out the window. And although we're measuring vital signs, they're not always the key to what we use to determine if we can go further or not. We use symptoms and signs of inflammation more than anything else. Any questions so far? I, I, I think I'll finish before the seven hour and 45 minutes. I think I'll, I'll, I'll just finish in the next seven hours and 45 minutes. Um, so let me just go through an, an eval process with you. And then, you know, if you ever wanted to like talk more about this, like this is not a one hour talk, um, but it was short notice. So anyway, date, that's the date. So you write down the date, day, year, month. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but then, you know, so this is what I want to know about a patient. So age, where do you live? I see a lot of people from around the country. I see a lot of people around the world. So I just want to try to put the whole picture together of the person. Who are you? Where do you live? What do you do? Were you tested for COVID-19, either PCR, nasal swab? And if yes, were you positive or negative? So this is a source of controversy. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was sharing. Give me one second. Let me, let me. So this is a source of controversy in the COVID world, right? Because there is a whole group of people that say, well, guess what? You tested negative, you don't have COVID. Or you tested negative, you didn't have COVID. Or you tested negative, you, you know, or you don't have antibodies, you don't have COVID, okay? And a lot of programs won't accept a patient unless they had a po positive COVID test. And I already told you that a huge amount of our patients were seen in March, you know, got sick in March and April guess what? You couldn't even get a COVID test at that time. So it's like, it's almost like a practical joke, right? So the way we do things in our clinic and also in our, our study that we're doing and in our research is if you have the symptoms, we treat you as if you had COVID. We, we, so we're, we're allowing people in whether or not they had a common PCR, uh, you know, a positive PCR, whether or not they have positive antibodies or not, because guess what? If it acts like COVID, I mean, it's just highly unlikely that somebody would develop, you know, chest pain, shortness of breath, dysautonomia, uh, you know, brain fog, all at the same time that millions of other people in the world were, and they didn't have COVID. And if that one, you know, I don't think most people get their kicks by going to the COVID clinic if they didn't really have COVID. So if somebody has the symptoms, we treat them as if. Um, 
when did you first experience your initial symptoms? Again, uh, the majority of people that we've seen are February, March, and April. Again, the question about long haulers is, well, maybe had these patients been admitted to the hospital, maybe had their vital signs been monitored for those first three months, maybe had they been getting, you know, blood pressure medications or oxygen or bronchodilators or anti-inflammatories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, maybe they wouldn't have become long haulers, right? That's a big question. Not to put blame on anybody, it was brand new, so we didn't know. What were your initial symptoms? So we know that a lot of people were short of breath. A lot of people had, you know, tachycardia, fatigue, <coughs> excuse me, chest pain, um, brain fog, um, loss of taste and smell, many, many different things. And what we know now is that people can have any type of symptom related to any type of system. And we just have to take that in and continually ask ourselves, what is happening here? What is the physiologic explanation for this and how can we possibly explain this and what we found is that as people's overall net inflammation seems to go down then more and more of their symptoms decrease in terms of frequency intensity and duration did you go to the er urgent care many people did many people were turned away were you hospitalized and if yes for how long were you admitted to the icu if yes for how long were you intubated or placed on a ventilator? If yes, for how long? So again, these people right here are more than likely the patients who are older, the patients who had pre-existing conditions, the patients who were in a more extreme state when they went to the emergency room and they were like, yeah, you look pretty bad, come on in. And then again, these are not typically the patients that we see as long haulers, okay? So for those patients, the ones that were on a ventilator, the ones that were in the ICU, the ones who had a prolonged oxygen stay, those people, you can start to rehab again, super slowly, but you can rehab those very much like you would typically rehab a critically ill patient. What medications, prescription or over-the-counter do you receive? Um, another thing that I, I find, and, and I have no proof of this, it's just my gut feeling, um, I think it's really important that when you try any type of intervention, whether it be a medication or an exercise or a breathing technique or a supplement or a food diet change, um, that you try to implement one change at a time, right? Because again, the body is trying to reestablish equilibrium and the more things you give it to do it at, at a time, the le A, the less chance it has of doing them, okay? And B, you're not gonna know what's doing what. So I have a friend who works at this place called Wilner Chemists in New York City, which is like, it's the Star Trek equivalent of, sub of supplements, okay? So it's like, if you love supplements, the way Trekkies love Star Trek, that's where you go. And these guys know every supplement, they know every, they know what shelf it's on, they know how much it costs, they know every brand name. And they're saying that people are coming in and buying 10 anti-inflammatory supplements, right? And they start taking them all at once, but not only can you not <coughs> tell what's doing what, but you know, if you get 10 anti-inflammatory things, it's like 10 great tastes that don't necessarily taste great together. And sometimes those can even increase inflammation. And again, in the same way that I said before, physical, emotional, or cognitive, we have to think of all things because I've seen people set, set off by medications. I've seen people set off by activity or stress. I've seen people set off by supplements and I've seen people set off by foods. So again, uh, I'm a believer that the body knows what it wants to do and it knows how to heal and really important, not so much to, to always be making a move, but to make sure you stay out of the body's way don't do anything to harm it and let it do what it knows how to do naturally. Um, did you see a cardiologist or did you have any of the following cardiac tests? So again, EKG, often normal. Halter, often normal. Echo, often normal. Stress test, stress echo, often normal. Cardiac MRI is often where the first evidence of any type of cardiac insult is. And it's not usually a heart attack. So I've only seen one patient who had a heart attack post COVID and they were they were somebody who had a lot of risk factors and they also had a heart attack pre-COVID. So you know that one heart attack predisposes you to another heart attack. Um, did you see a pulmonary doctor? Chest x-ray, often normal. CAT scan, often normal. PFT, often normal. Um, did you see a neurologist? MRI or CAT scan? Did you see any other kind of doctors? So here's where I go into my evaluation. And let me just see how many pages it is so I can know how fast I should talk. All right. So 
we're gonna go we're gonna do the next eight minutes at warp speed so here we go um so i'm gonna just ask you the questions CCHPI means chief complaint history of present illness. Um, we want to know what the chief complaint is, but don't be surprised if somebody has 10 chief complaints. Okay. Uh, and so I'll say to somebody, well, if you had three wishes right now, and you can either take three one point wishes, or you could use one three point wish or a two point wish in a one, what are the three things you would like us to, to fix that would make your life better right now that would really solve a lot of your problems? And you know, that's where keep the main thing the main thing is. And again, this is a super communication between the clinician and the patient. And it's gotta be, I have I have 150 people a day who send me texts and they say, I walk for three minutes. And I say, okay, repeat three minutes tomorrow. Okay, bye. Next day, three minutes. Okay, repeat three minutes again tomorrow. Okay, next day, three minutes. Okay, go up to four minutes. I got like 150 of those a day because we're literally stepping so slowly and we want to avoid mistakes. Most people are not on medication. Some are, but you know, some, there's some questionability about what works and what doesn't work now. It's hard to say. This is my systems review. So I'm going to just take you through this very quickly. Again, you know, one hour is like the super tip of the, the pinky nail on this. It's not enough time, but it's at least a, a sampler. Um, so fatigue, again, I mentioned fatigue, profound fatigue, okay? Um, lack of energy, the feeling of being washed out, the feeling of being able to get up from a chair or up from the bed. Fevers, a lot of people have fevers, but not everybody does. We see people who are post COVID whose fevers may cycle. They may come, if they become inflamed, they may spike a fever. They may come if they become stressed. Um, sometimes there's no rhyme or reason to it. Chills. So there's a problem with temperature regulation often. So the things that should make you hot don't make you hot. The things that might make you cold, you might still be hot. Exercise activity intolerance. And again, this has to do with not just what's going on at that moment, but it could be that, you know, it's enough to trigger inflammation. So your legs may not be tired from deconditioning, but that may be enough to trigger that inflammation and then you get short of breath and chest pain and other things and this and that, or you may feel fine during the exercise and then later that day you flare your symptoms or the next day you're knocked out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Always have to keep in mind, um, you know, post-exercise malaise and particularly people with other inflammatory, you know, conditions, things like mast cell activation syndrome or, you know, anyone who's going to be highly charged to begin with, we have to really work on quieting the system. Uh, sleep disturbances. A lot of people have difficulty sleeping. They're awakened from sleep. They can't fall asleep or they sleep too much. Do you have any neurologic problems? Have you ever passed out? Dizziness, stroke, seizure. Tremors and shakiness. We see a lot of tremors and shakiness. Another thing that you'll hear people say is internal tremors or internal vibrations. We don't know exactly what those things are, but we think it's some type of dysautonomia slash autonomic dysfunction slash, slash peripheral neuropathy. Um, do you have pain, numbness, tingling? Keep in mind that, you know, what we might normally think of as pain, numbness, and tingling, it may be coming from a completely different source. So it may be the autonomic nervous system misfiring, and it may not be musculoskeletal. But also keep in mind that things can be musculoskeletal. Just because you do have COVID or post-COVID doesn't mean you can't have other things. History of other neurologic or post-viral conditions, things like Epstein-Barr, things like, uh, you know, a lot of different people have had shingles before, chicken pox. Um, H-E-E-N-T is head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. Do you get a lot of headaches? Headache is very common, okay? Uh, I often ask people if they give a lot of headaches. Um, do you have any ringing in the ears, vertigo, sinus trouble? Have you lost your taste or smell? Altered taste or smell, okay? This is often an early sign of, of acute COVID. Uh, altered, sometimes people will say, oh, I smell burning tires, or you know, this food tastes different than it normally tastes. Do you have a sore throat or hoarse voice? Something to keep in mind with a lot of these patients is the potential for reflux. So if you think about the fact that the esophagus and the trachea are very, very close together, if you have a lot of reflux, and we see this a lot in people, that can come up. That could go to the sinuses and inflame the sinuses. That can come up and go into the trachea and inflame the airways. So these things are all very, very connected. Keep in mind that inflammation begets inflammation and that keep the main thing the main thing. Do you have any respiratory problems? Uh, you have, have you ever been told you have asthma, COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, 
have you had pneumonia in the past? Now, there are people who are having asthma-like symptoms. Okay, they never had asthma before, but it's almost like a reactive airway disease. And we live in a world where people love to diagnose. They love to give a diagnosis. And the thing is that I wouldn't be so quick to diagnose with somebody with asthma as much I would, as I would say, you know what, there's some kind of airway reactivity going on there. And another point is that a lot of people will have a normal pulmonary function test because not every pulmonary function test does what's called MVV, maximum voluntary ventilation. That's where for 10 seconds you go, <laughs> and if the person would have gone on, much like in the same way I said before, if you would have gone on and done the cardiac MRI, you might've found something. If you had gone and done the MVV, you might've found something because that is what's going to elicit that bronchospasm that so many people feel. So these are just little tips and you know, don't assume that anybody knows anything uh, it's, it's anyone's game at this point. So have you had pneumonia? Are you coughing? Are you bringing up mucus? Okay. So there's a big difference in how we handle a dry cough versus somebody who is producing a lot of secretions. And if they are producing a lot of secretions, then chest physical therapy, airway clearance devices, this is going to be part of the important treatment. Shortness of breath, uh, on exertion, shortness of breath at rest. I'm going to ramp up the speed a little bit. Wheezing, um, occupational exposure, which means like, have you ever been exposed to heavy dust, chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have any chest pain or pressure? OPQ or STI, this means onset. What were you doing when it happened? P is provocation, palliation. What makes it better? What makes it worse? What's the quality? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Does it feel like an elephant sitting on your chest? R is radiation. So is it staying in one spot? Is it moving around? Is it traveling down your arm? S is severity. On a scale of one to 10, how bad is the chest pain? T is timing. How long did it last? Is it constant or intermittent? And I is interventions. Did you do anything to treat this chest pain, shortness of breath, et cetera, et cetera? When you lie in bed at night, are you able to lie flat? Do you ever wake up in the middle of the night short of breath? Do your feet swell? Have you ever been told you have coronary disease, congestive heart failure, heart heart attack? Did you ever give anyone a heart attack? High blood pressure, low blood pressure, label blood, labile blood pressure, which means up and down, up and down. We see that a lot. Is your cholesterol normal? Pulmonary hypertension, tachybrady, so fast heart rate, slow heart rate, other arrhythmias. Do you have any stomach problems? Do you have any urinary problems? Do you have any vascular or circulation problems? Blood disorders, thyroid trouble, diabetes, osteoporosis. Skin problems, musculoskeletal problems, joint swelling, stiffness, pain, arthritis, bony pain, or aches, muscle cramping or twitching, which we see a lot. That's where the electrolytes and fluids come in handy. Um, arthritis, are you depressed? Are you anxious? Are you under unusual stress? If you're not all of the above, then something's wrong with you, okay? This is an extremely stressful time in our lives. And um, so I think that covers it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know that's like a lot, a lot, and it's a super short amount of time. But, and again, this is not something like you're going to memorize what I just said, and now you're going to know what to do with every patient. Okay. Every patient must be treated as an individual. Every session must be treated as an individual um, session, right? We must meet the patient where they are at that moment in time. It's like, we don't care how many safe flights a plane has had. If ours isn't safe, it doesn't matter how many they had before. And I always say, you know, a patient is only as safe as their most recent workout. And as clinicians and as patients, you know, always keep in mind, primum non nocere, do no harm. And always keep in mind that, um, you know, we could do everything 100% right. And if we get the wrong patient on the wrong day, something could still go wrong. So we have to be super careful. However, just make sure you're doing everything right. Questions? Everyone's probably like, what the hell did that guy just say? <laughs> so here's just one last thing I'll end with, which will be useful for you. Um, we have a online program at pulmonarywellness.org. And we have on there COVID rehab and recovery lectures where we've brought in really top experts who are really brilliant and they've given their ideas on it. We also have an online boot camp for COVID patients and all of our services are free of charge. Feel free to use them, feel free to dig into them, feel free to get the idea. Uh, if you uh, you know like hearing me speed talk, you'll get to hear it a lot. Um, you'll see a lot of hairstyles, glasses and, and, and clothing, um, but, um, but it'll at least give you some ideas, you know? And again, there's no way on earth that I expected to do an hour with you and you're like, 
now I know what to do. No, because, you know, we are muddling our way through this an inch at a time with every patient and we learn with every single patient. And, you know, as we've gone along, we start to see similarities. We start to see differences, but patient safety is first and foremost in everything that we do. Hey, I'll say something. Yes, um, ma'am. I just want to say that I found out about NOAA and the long hauler um, support group just a few weeks ago. And I, nine months into my long haul journey left with um, a lot of recovery um, at the time that I found it and wish I had found him earlier, but the level of support there changes everything. It's the kind of, you know, not being alone and being able to feel like you give and offer support to people. And I'm a psychotherapist too in Charlottesville and I'm working with other long haulers, you know, like myself. So I just um, can't say enough for if you know anybody that's having these crazy, unpredictable, terrifying symptoms that that support group is un unbelievable. And uh, thank you, Noah. Thank you. You know, and another thing is that, you know, you're not going to find a doctor who's an expert on COVID. Okay. They don't exist. Okay. So, you know, when somebody like, you know, I always say like it, you know, the more tools we have, the better we're going to be prepared and the more things we could try. It's like if Thor gets into a fight, he's probably going to use his hammer because it's all he's got. Right. But we want to try different things. We want people who are going to be open-minded to different things. And the person who comes to you and says, well, you have to do it this way because this does this, this, and this. I worry about that person because COVID is very, very different. COVID is very different than anything else. So anyone who's claiming to be a, an expert on post-COVID care, run the other way. Let me see if there's other questions in here. Website is www.pulmonarywellness.org. And I'll just, I'll just show you, I'll just show you quickly one more thing. Um, so, We also have tons of webinars here. So we have a book that I wrote that is available to read for free. It's here in Spanish, working on the Chinese as we speak. There's a ton of webinars here. Da, 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 da. Here's a research. We are doing research now on women between 18 and 55 who got sick in February, March, and April. And we're doing a study on the benefit of exercise and oxygen in those long haulers. Here's the COVID rehab and recovery lectures. and you know, again, I had some really smart people on here. Um, this is a great one on anti-inflammatory nutrition. There's two of those, but, you know, anything that you could possibly think of and hopefully some things that you didn't think of. Um, and then over here is our boot camp. And boot camp, let me just log in and I can show you what that looks like. Okay, so this looks like this. So for example, here's day one. So every day has uh, four different things. So ODB, which is my secret Brooklyn tribute to old dirty bastard. Um, I am a hip hop head, um, but our daily breath, thoughts and motivation. So what this is gonna be is like a thought and idea that we want you to take in. Breathing balance, flexibility and strength. And then we have these pulmonary cardio walkabouts and what we did was um, we started um, we started the walkabouts at four minutes and went up by one minute in the original boot camp. But what we did for the um, what we did for COVID boot camp is we broke them down even further. So, for example, we have three minute, two minute, one minute walk, and these are videos that we shot all over the world, and they're virtual walks, and they're fun, and there's good music. Like we tried not to make this like your traditional boring, you know, vanilla type stuff, and Everyone on my team is either an artist or an actor or a, you know, some kind of performer. So it's, it's a little different, but if you like that kind of thing, it's, it's good. Other questions, comments. I think we're out of time. We went over, sorry guys, but uh, I hope that you learned something and we do have, um, if you sign up to our webpage, then you'll receive updates as to when we do lectures and you're welcome to attend anything that we do. This was incredible. Thank you so much for your time. I don't want it to end. I want to just keep listening to you. You could sing some hip hop songs, whatever. I just don't want you to stop. Don't call it a comeback. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, and, and again, this is not, you know, usually I honestly, I usually don't, 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 I usually don't take talks for less than two hours. Um, but we could really go on for six, seven, eight hours and talk about this because it's really what it's about. And it is, it's fascinating. You know, it really is fascinating. Like I have to say, like, you know, for the first time in a long time, like my brain is lit up, like for the first time in about 20 years, it's like every day I have to think I get home. I'm like, Hmm, my brain really got some good blood flow this week, you know? Um, and it's exciting. I mean, it sucks that it's, you know, that it took a global pandemic for that to happen. Um, but it is exciting. And I do think we're getting somewhere and I do think we're on the road to certain things. I think it's going to take a, a while. You know what I mean? I think it's new territory and it's like, you know, um, when Hiram Bingham, you know, discovered Machu Picchu, you clear that earth little by little by little by little. Um, and hopefully, you know, as treatment gets better, there won't be long haulers in the future. And hopefully we're going to, you know, get these long haulers out, out of, uh, out of the woods. And, you know, we've seen very, very good results. So, um, you know, would you recommend not trying a startup post rehab program if we don't have access to great equipment to track vitals? If you can't track vitals, then you really shouldn't be. I mean, you can track vitals without, a, you know, without an EKG. So you could get a pulse ox, you could check heart rate, you could check rhythm, you know, manually, you can check blood pressure. Um, I mean, the EKG, you know, if, if let's say somebody goes into SVT at 150, you're going to see that on a pulse ox anyway, you know, again, the majority of patients that we're seeing are people who are young, healthy, uh, no real medical condition. So it's not like their problem is coronary ischemia. So I'm not saying I wouldn't do it without an EKG, but I would say, you know, if you want to, if you're thinking of starting up a program, call me, I'll kind of help you get it going because it's not like, it's, it's not like a, you flip it up and, and do it, but no, I, I wouldn't recommend not doing it at all, but that then means we have to, you know, it's like we have to then go that much slower. It's the difference between like flying a plane with or without an altimeter. It's like, you know, if you don't know what height you're at or what altitude you're at, well, you have to go that much slower. So, but I, listen, I think everybody, I think we're going to need as much COVID rehab as the world can take. So I wouldn't rule anybody out from doing it. Um, you know, I think that we're going to need a lot of it. So I think there's ways to modify it. I think there's ways to make it safe. And, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't quit the game before you start the game. All right. I think that's a wrap. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Greg, you have a question? No, I just see, uh, Sarah has her hand raised. Sarah, I don't. Sarah, you can talk. Okay, let's see. Sarah, you can unmute. And there we go. Okay. All right. So I have a question. Um, I missed the first 15 minutes and I apologize. I had some troubles connecting. <laughs> so maybe you talked about this, but do you work with multi symptom inflammatory syndrome? Teenagers or young people who are going through that post COVID? And is it kind of the same of what you've been talking about in terms of dealing with them? So we didn't address that. That's a great question. Um, I would say that um, I haven't seen a lot. I've seen a few. Um, and I think there are big differences between adults and kids. I think that the things that kids wind up in trouble with are different than the things that adults wind up in trouble with. I'd say if I were going to give you two principles that probably apply to both, it's, it's the same thing, which is first, do no harm. And number two, go slower than you think you can do. So I'm, I'm not saying I wouldn't take a kid. I've seen a few children, but you know, again, the stakes are a little bit higher. And you know, I, I think the more kind of specialties you bring in as far as pediatrics, pediatric neurology, pediatric, you know, things like, I think that's a good place to start. Um, but I haven't personally seen a lot of children. I've seen maybe three children. Okay. I'm a believer that people in general, COVID or not, you know, need more breathing exercise, need more meditation, need to quiet the sympathetic nervous system anyway. So, you know, I think these things are all very, very positive and very good. You know, I, I think COVID is like a metaphor for life. And I, I think it's important that we recognize that, um, you know, we played a role in, in COVID. You know what I mean? It's like, you can't 
graze every forest, you can't pollute every ocean, you can't, you know, eat every bat in the cave and expect that, you know, nothing is going to happen to humans. And I think that, you know, hopefully this is a time, you know, it's like who wound up in the cages? We did, right? Like COVID came and now we're the ones that are in a cage. So I hope that, you know, if nothing else, people get the idea that, you know, we are not just, you know, the masters of the universe, but rather that we have a responsibility to be stewards of the earth and the environment. And that's, that plays a role here. So it's like, you know, it can't make everything about ourselves. And when people say things like, you know, uh, I've never been sick before, and they're complaining, because I say, well, you know what, that's a blessing. But most people do, most animals do get hurt once in a while, most, you know, birds do hurt themselves once in a while. So, you know, I think it's really important to just look at the lessons we could get. Maybe we were going too fast. Maybe we were too efficient at killing and polluting and destroying and things like that. See, you, you're starting to wish you got off like 30 seconds ago, right? But, but, it's, but it's really true. Um, and I think that we have to take care of ourselves and, and look and listen and learn and say, what can we learn from this? to make things better. Here's a quote, I'm an athlete, COVID in November, no symptoms, but still haven't been able to get myself back to pre-COVID. We have many active duty clients who don't have the luxury of long, slow fitness, Ag agree. But you know what? Um, the thing is that um, there are people who, um, again, remember that kind of formula I told you before, which is physical, emotional. I think that, you know, I know you guys see a lot of veterans and a lot of military people. If you don't, there, there's a saying, I don't remember it exactly, but it's something like this. It's like, if you don't take the time for your health now, you're going to have to take the time for disease later. And the thing about um, COVID is that you can't, you can't push it. We're on COVID's timeline. Okay. We're on COVID's timeline. When COVID says, you know, Noah, you may take one step forward. We say COVID may I, right? And it says, no, you can't, then we don't. Okay. Because if we do, if we come head to head with COVID, we lose every time. Okay. And I know people who have worked through COVID. I know people who have, you know, kids to take care of, families to take care of. They have other responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera. Those people don't typically do as well. When you can't devote this time to healing, it, it spreads things out. It increases your flares. And it, so, you know, as a, as a, as a unit, as a, as a society, I think that we have to somehow build something in so that people have this time to heal because maybe six weeks of no work and, and still being paid or being supported or what have you, maybe that takes long haul from, you know, 12 months to three months. It's still a good bargain, but, you know, with, I feel for the people who are military, who are, you know, post COVID who are experiencing symptoms and have a drill sergeant screaming in their face or something like that. Um, you know, but it's, it's, it, you really can't do it. It's like a riptide. It's like the riptide comes, you can't fight the current. COVID is bigger than us. It's stronger than us. It never gets tired. And you have to go at COVID's pace. And again, if you spend all your money on, uh, you know, on, on things that, you know, that, that are overdoing it, you're not going to be able to heal. You're not going to have that budget left to heal. I'll just sit here. So if you have more questions, throw them out. I just want to add that I'm a long hauler, uh, about eight and a half months in here on the Zoom with y'all. Noah just alerted a few of us that you were going to be here together. And um, I've been with Noah since July. And I nodded so much throughout that my neck almost hurts. I mean, every word he said has been our experience. It's been true. Um, and working with him um, just on simple things, understanding compression garments, electrolytes, and then getting into all the touchy feely woo woo stuff, um, you know, learning how to do the breathing exercises and calming the sympathetic nervous system has meant everything to me. And after eight and a half months, I'm, I kind of keep saying I'm about 80, 85% back to normal. I'm certainly 100% functional, which I wasn't for many, many months. So. It is a long haul. The term long haul was coined for a reason. It does take a long time. Yeah, and it might- You can't get better. You can't get better. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Martha. But, but you know, the other thing is that it might take six more months or a year, you know? And people are shocked when you say that. They're like, what? I have to wait a year before I heal from the flu? And again, that's another way that I mean that it's, um, that it's, it's more like a multi-system trauma. Like, right, like we've had patients, I've had, had 
when I first started, in my first week, I got a patient who literally got hit and dragged by a Mack truck. She was in rehab for a year and a half, you know, or somebody gets a, a, a very, very bad injury. And that's what I think COVID is going to be like. You know, some people get lucky. And again, there's a huge variability. Some people don't even know they had it. Somehow they wind up with antibodies. But for some people, you know, it's going to take a long time. But I do believe we are making progress. I do believe that there's certainly a ton of people working on this. I think that, you know, we're gaining more knowledge and getting the hang of things. But, you know, it's brand new. Um, you know, it's brand new. And, and again, I think it, it takes time and you can't rush it. We're on COVID's timeline. And then only, you know, the other takeaway to this is, well, you know, well, what are we going to do about it? Well, put your masks on, don't go out to eat, don't go get your hair cut, right? Like, it's all okay. Like, don't fight for the things that are super luxuries that don't mean anything while others are dying or getting sick. And it's not just life and death with COVID, it's, you know, debilitating uh, discomfort and symptoms. So there's a whole range, but, you know, one of my favorite quotes from movies is, is any given Sunday when Al Pacino's in the locker room and he says, you know, we either win as a team or we die as individuals. And that's really a, a metaphor for COVID because it's like, we can't save this ship if 90% of us are trying to bail the boat out and 10% of us or, or more are shooting holes in the bottom of the boat. So, all right, I think that's a wrap. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you so very, very much. Come back anytime. Happy to, let me know when. Thank you. All right, take care guys, bye-bye.